Hello, I'm Dr. Maurice Dupre, and in this section we're going to discuss partial derivatives. So, for a function of several variables, and here this f could be a function of x, y, or x, y, and z, or x, y, z, u, v, w, any number of variables, it doesn't matter. When we write this Greek delta in this fashion, it's pronounced delta, delta f over delta v, but with this type of symbol. Um, that is also denoted f with a little subscript v. This is our notation for what we call the partial derivative of f with respect to v. To compute f sub v, what we do is we think of all the other variables as constant and differentiate with respect to the variable v. In other words, no matter how many variables you see in the expression for the function, when you're trying to partial differentiate with respect to v, concentrate on that one and think of everything else, every other symbol is just a symbol for a constant and differentiate with respect to the variable v that you're interested in. Well, let's do it for practice. So here we have the function f of x, y, z equals x squared y plus y, z, e to the x, z squared, and we're going to compute its partial derivatives. So let's start with the partial derivative of f with respect to x. We can denote that by f with the subscript x or with the partial differentiation symbols df dx equals, and so remember when we're doing this, we're going to think of y and z as constants. So let's look at the first term. The derivative of x squared is 2x times the constant y, so we just have 2xy. Of course, y isn't a constant, but in this process, we're just going to think of it as a constant. Now let's look at the next term. We've got the coefficient yz of e to the power xz squared. So there's the x up there in the exponent. Again, yz is a constant, and also up here in the exponent, the z squared is treated as a constant. So we have yz e to the xz squared multiplied by the derivative of what's up in the exponent. Remember the chain rule. So the derivative of xz squared with respect to x is simply z squared because we're treating the z squared as a constant. So there we have the partial derivative of our function with respect to x. Now let's look at the partial derivative with respect to y. f subscript y or df dy with the partial derivative notation. So now this is getting a little trickier. We're going to think of x and z as constants and we're differentiating with respect to y. y is our variable now. So when I look at this first expression, think of that as constant and y is the variable. So to di differentiate constant times variable, it's just the constant times the derivative of the e variable expression. And of course, the derivative of y with respect to y is just 1. So our first term, differentiating with respect to y, just results in x squared. Plus, now let's look at our second term. Notice in our second term, we have yz e to the xz squared. There's no y in this exponential expression. So in effect, we just have y times what we are going to be considering or treating as a constant. The derivative of y is 1, so we just get z e to the xz squared for the partial derivative of f with respect to y. Now let's compute the partial derivative with respect to z. This can get even a little trickier still. Now we're thinking of x and y as constant. Excuse me, this is with respect to z. We're thinking of x and y as constant. So notice when I look at this first term, x squared y, it's completely constant as we're treating it when z is the variable we're differentiating with respect to. So the first term's derivative is 0, and we go immediately to the second term. The y is a constant, but now I have 
two factors here which involve the z. Here's the z itself, and then the exponential function has the z expression in its exponent. So consequently, we're going to have to use the product rule on the second term. So derivative of the first factor, which would be simply y times the second e to the xz squared, plus the first factor yz times the derivative of the second factor with respect to z. Now, by the chain rule, that would just be e to whatever is there times the derivative of what's up there in the exponent with respect to z. Well, the derivative of z squared is 2z, and of course the x rides along as a constant, so we end up with 2xz. And so finally, then, our partial derivative with respect to z has two terms that came out of the differentiation of this last term itself, the first term having derivative zero with respect to z. We have two terms coming out because we had to apply the product rule involving differentiation with respect to z. Now let's look at a problem involving higher partial derivatives for a function. So here in this problem, we want to show the second mixed partial derivatives are equal for the expression w equal 2x e to the y minus y e to the x squared plus z e to the y. So let's begin with the partial derivative with respect to x. w sub x is derivative of the first term with respect to x is just 2 e to the y because y is like a constant. Derivative of the second term with respect to x, well, we have minus y as a constant, so we have y e to the x squared times the derivative of what's up in the exponent with respect to x, 2x, plus derivative of the last term, which is z e to the y with respect to x, well, that's all constant, and so that would just be a zero, so we'll just forget that. And so there's our partial derivative with respect to x. Now, for mixed partial derivatives, we can take the partial derivative with respect to x and differentiate, say, with respect to y. What would we get? Well, the derivative of 2e to the y with respect to y is just 2e to the y. And what about this? When I differentiate this with respect to y, all of the e to the x squared 2x is just a constant. And so Differentiating with respect to y, derivative of y is 1 with respect to y. We just get that constant, minus e to the x squared times the 2x. What about the partial derivative of x with respect to z, the w sub xz? That is, we take this derivative with respect to x and differentiate it with respect to z. Well, notice z doesn't appear anywhere in that expression as far as z is concerned. It's a constant, so that derivative is zero. Now let's look at the partial derivative of w with respect to y. Derivative of e to the y is e to the y. 2x is just a constant, so for the first term we get 2x e to the y. Minus differentiating negative y e to the x squared with respect to y. This e to the x squared is just a constant, and so the y derivative of y is 1, so we just get negative e to the x squared. And the derivative of z e to the y with respect to y is plus z e to the y. So now let's differentiate that. Well, first let's differentiate with respect to x derivative of 2x e to the y, the 2 and the e to the y are just constant, so differentiating with respect to x just eliminates the x, we get 2 e to the y. Minus derivative of e to the x squared with respect to x is e to the x squared times 2x. Last term doesn't have an x, so we're done. What about the derivative w sub y z? That is the partial derivative of w sub y itself with respect to z, where the z, where is a z only in this last term, so that's the only thing that'll give us anything differentiate with respect to z. The e to the y is constant, derivative of z with respect to z is 1, so we just get e to the y. Finally, let's differentiate with respect to z. 
Notice for the W, the first two terms have no z. The last term is just ze to the y. That's just a constant. So the derivative with respect to z of z itself is 1 constant times 1, that constant, which is e to the y. So there's the partial derivative of w with respect to z. It's just e to the y. So what is w sub z x? Notice there's no x there, so it's 0. What is w sub z y? Well, the derivative of e to the y is e to the y. So now let's compare our mixed partial derivatives to see they're equal and in what sense do we mean. What we mean is that reversing the order of mixing doesn't make any difference. That is, w sub x y should be the same as w sub y x. Where's w sub y x? It's right here. 2e to the y minus e to the x squared 2x, 2e to the y minus e to the x squared 2x. Uh, what about w sub x z? That's 0. w sub z x, that's 0. w sub y z is e to the y. w sub z y is e to the y. In other words, as far as partial differentiation is concerned, for functions which have continuous partial derivatives and second partial derivatives, in fact, it is a theorem that it doesn't matter in which order you differentiate, you'll get the same result either way. If I take a function of x and y and several variables and say I first differentiate with respect to x and then take that result differentiate with respect to y, I'll get the exact same thing as if I first differentiate with respect to y, take that result and differentiate with respect to x. Remember, when you take the derivative, you're really finding a tangent slope. In the case of a function of two variables, for instance, when I take the partial derivative with respect to x, I'm finding the tangent slope to the surface of the graph in the x direction. When I take the partial derivative with respect to y, I'm finding the tangent slope in the y direction. Well, let's look at an example where we calculate slopes in different directions for a surface find the slopes in the x and y directions for the surface x squared plus y squared plus z squared equal 14 at the point 2 comma 1 comma 3. Well, we recognize right away that x squared plus y squared plus z squared equal 14 is the uh, equation for a sphere centered at the origin of radius square root 14, which I've indicated here. And so I've made a little perspective drawing here, just a rough sketch showing where the point 2 comma 1 comma 3 would be. Um, notice it's a little bit forward, two units forward of the yz plane and one unit to the right of the xz plane and three units above the xy plane. And so for the x direction, that's into the blackboard. In effect, the plane uh, vertical and parallel to the x-axis cuts through that sphere and consequently makes a curve, which obviously is a circle, and the tangent to that circle at that point I've indicated with this little blue line, whereas in the y direction, the plane through the point 2 comma 1 comma 3, which is actually parallel to the yz plane, cuts through that sphere in another circle, and tangent then in the y direction, we have another little blue-green line. And so what we'd like to do is find the slopes of those lines, and that's what the partial derivatives actually tell us. So let's do the calculation. We have x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 14. So we want to solve for z in terms of x and y. So we have z squared equals 14 minus x squared minus y squared. And so z itself is then plus or minus the square root of 14 minus x squared minus y squared. Notice we have two possible solutions here, two choices for how to get z in terms of x and y. And the one we have to choose is the one which has the point we're interested in, 2, 1, comma 3, on it. 
notice the Z coordinate is positive here, and so consequently we're going to need to choose the positive side. So in other words, this tells us that Z equals the square root of 14 minus X squared minus Y squared is the expression for Z in terms of X and Y, which will hold around this point. And so now to find the slope of that surface in the X direction, we just take the partial derivative DZ DX and we evaluate that at x equal 2, y equals 1. So the partial derivative dz dx, well notice first off we've got a radical here, something raised to the 1 half power, its derivative is 1 half, the expression inside raised to the negative a half times the derivative of what's inside with respect to x. Well, the only term that contributes anything is the negative x squared, and its derivative is negative 2x. Of course, we can cancel the 2's, and so we finally arrive at z sub x equals negative x divided by the square root of the 14 minus x squared minus y squared which you might notice is in fact, look at the denominator, that's our z. So we have a really a simple form for this, negative x over z. Well, what about in the y direction? We're going to calculate dz dy instead of uh, dz dx, and notice the form of this expression is just the same in terms of y as it is in terms of x. In other words, the z sub y should be negative y over z. Well, let's do that one. So we have z equals square root 14 minus x square minus y square and uh, so dz dy equals 1 half 14 minus x square minus y squared to the negative a half times the derivative of what's inside with respect to y. 14 minus x squared is thought of as constant, so we just get negative 2y here. Again, the 2's cancel, and we get, in effect, z sub y is negative y divided by square root 14 minus x squared minus y square. Well, notice again the square root 14 minus x square minus y square is z, and so we're just getting simply negative y over z. Um, why is it such a simple final result? Let's look at this again. z sub x is negative x over z. z sub y is negative y over z. Well, suppose I look at the original expression, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 14, and I say to myself, well, the z can be expressed in terms of x and y. We know that. We did it. So, consequently, let's just assume it is an expression in x and y and differentiate both sides of that e equation with respect to x. When I do, I get the derivative of x squared is 2x, the derivative of y squared is 0, the derivative of z squared is 2z times z sub x according to the chain rule, and the derivative of 14 is of course 0. Well notice the 2's cancel right off and we end up with x plus z times z sub x equals 0, solving that for z sub x we find z sub x is negative x over z. Likewise, if I were to do this differentiating with respect to y instead of with respect to x, I would have derivative of x squared is 0 with respect to y, derivative of y squared is 2y, derivative of z squared is 2z times z sub y by the chain rule equals 0. Again, 2's cancel. 
And what happens? We have a very simple equation, y plus z, z sub y equals zero, and so that tells us z sub y is negative y over z. Well, that just shows there's more than one way to skin a cat. We found our partial derivatives, and in order to get the slope at the point we are particularly interested in, we now simply have to put the values for our coordinates of that point into the expressions. So let me just erase a little space here, and we'll come back and just put our partial derivatives up. Here's our equation, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equal 14, and we've calculated that z sub x is simply negative x over z. z sub y is negative y over z, and the point we're interested in is the point 2, 1, 3. And so for the slope in the x direction, x equals 2, z equals 3, we get negative two-thirds. For the slope in the y direction, y equals one, z equals three, so we have negative one-third, and that's all there is to it. So what that's doing is telling us the tilts of these two lines in these various directions. In the x direction, our slope is negative two-thirds. Notice that's going down, so this line is coming out of the blackboard, in fact, its slope is negative two-thirds, whereas this line is parallel to the, I should say, whiteboard, not blackboard. It's going down, its slope is negative one-third. So in this direction, you see we're going down twice as fast as we're going down in this direction. Well, there you have it. You just take the point you're interested in and put it into the partial derivatives, and that gives you the slopes you need. Okay, now let's look at a problem. This is typical that we have to deal with with functions of several variables. We want to find points where the slopes in all directions are zero, that is horizontal. What does that mean for a function of two variables? If the slopes in the x, y, in the x direction and the y direction are both horizontal, then that tells you the tangent plane to the graph there is horizontal, and of course that means you might have the possibility of a local maximum or a local minimum. In any case, let's look at the problem. For f of x comma y equal 2x squared plus 2y squared plus 3xy minus 5x minus 2y, find all values of x and y so that f sub x at x comma y equals zero and f sub y at x comma y equals zero simultaneously. In other words, I'm looking for a particular point on the surface of the graph, in effect, where not only is the slope in the y direction horizontal, but the slope in the x direction at that point is also horizontal, so in effect the tangent plane to the graph is horizontal. Okay, so to begin with, what we want to do is just start computing partial derivatives. So let's just write down our function f of xy is equal to 2x squared plus 2y squared plus 3xy minus 5x minus 2y. And so what's our derivative with respect to x? The partial derivative of f with respect to x is 2 times the derivative of x squared, which is 2 times 2x, or 4x. What's the derivative of that with respect to x? 0, because differentiating with respect to x, remember, y is constant. Here, we have the constant 3y times x, whose derivative with respect to x is the constant 3y minus 5 times the derivative of x, so we just end up with minus 5, and of course the derivative of that with respect to x is 0. So the derivative with respect to x is just simply 4x plus 3y minus 5. Now, what's the derivative with respect to y of the function? Well, the 
partial derivative of the first term with respect to y is obviously zero since x is thought of as constant when partial differentiating with respect to y. Here, for 2y squared, the derivative is 2 times 2y, so that's 4y. And here for the term 3xy, differentiating with respect to y, we're going to get 3x. So we have plus 3x, and then the derivative of negative 5x with respect to y is 0, and the derivative of negative 2y with respect to y is just negative 2. So we have two simple equations there, and we want to set these expressions both equal to 0. Let me just write the little word set. You set them equal to 0 and solve simultaneously. So we have two simple, what are called linear equations to solve simultaneously in x and y. Now the simplest thing to do here to start with is to move these constants to the right side of the equation. So when I do that, I end up with 4x plus 3y equals 5, 4y plus 3x equals 2, and now we have two simple linear equations to solve simultaneously. Now, there are a lot of ways to go about solving such a simple system of linear equations. Uh, the one I like, which I think is fairly simple, is to uh, eliminate the various variables by uh, uh, multiplying through by appropriate constants and adding one equation to another. So the first thing to do when you start to do that is to write the equations so that the like variables are one on top of another. In effect, what I would begin by doing is rewriting the first, well, just copy the first equation. But in the second equation, I'm going to put the x term underneath the x term of the first equation. And so now you see when I look at it like this, the x's are on top of x's, y's on y's. And so now when I look at this, I'll ask myself, well, what multiple of these equations will make the coefficients of x the same so that when I add the two equations, all the x's disappear? Well, if I multiply the top equation by 3 and then multiply the bottom equation by negative 3, Let's write it like this, uh, excuse me, negative 4. Well, notice 3 times 4 is 12, negative 4 times 3 is negative 12, and so the x's, x terms will cancel out when I add one equation to another. So let's do it. Multiply the top equation through by 3, we get 12x plus 9y equals 15. Multiply the bottom equation by negative 4, we get negative 12x minus 16y equals negative 8. So when I add the two equations together, the x's cancel out, just leaving 0. 9y minus 16y is negative 7y, and 15 minus 8 is 7. And so this tells me right away that y equals negative 1. You see how easy this is? You just look at the coefficients of x. In effect, I multiply the top equation by the coefficient of x and the bottom equation. I multiply the bottom equation by the coefficient of x and the top equation, but just reverse the sign. And then when I do, the x coefficients are going to come out the same, but with opposite signs, and they'll totally cancel out the x's. You could do the same thing for the y's to get y. For instance, I mean to get x. So for instance, at this point I know that y equals negative 1. Let me just write this up here. y equals negative 1. And so we'll just do the same thing again. What I'll do, let's just simply erase this work. and erase these choices because now we're going to concentrate on 
eliminating y's. So what I'll do is multiply the top equation through by the coefficient of y down here and multiply the bottom equation by the coefficient of y up here, but again I'll reverse the sign. And so now when I do the top equation becomes 16x plus 12y equals 20, negative 9x minus 12y equals negative 6. And so now when I add the equations, 16x minus 9x is 11x. The y's, notice 12y minus 12y, just add up to nothing, equals 20 minus 6 is 14. And so, oh excuse me here, 16 minus 9x, that's not right. What's 16 minus 9? That's 7x. We have 7x equals 14, so x equals 2. And so our final solution then, and you can see the, the solution is unique. There's only one point where both partial derivatives are simultaneously 0. That's at x equal 2, y equal negative 1. That means the point 2 comma negative 1 is the unique solution. Well, now that you've seen some of these problems on partial differentiation work, you should try some on your own. Remember, it's a little tricky at first. Differentiating with respect to x is not so bad, thinking of y and z as constants, because you're used to differentiating with respect to the symbol x. It takes a little more practice to do it with respect to y and z, but you can do it with practice.